Okay. All right. So the next segment is about scheduling orchestration. So the does it work? One two. One two. One two. One two. No. Ah, I think I maybe I should click audio here. Then it <laughs> presentation still working. Cool. Okay. So the next one is about scheduling and orchestration. And the, before lunch, we talked about the basic building blocks of containers. Fair to say, I think. And now, since I'm the light dictator here, I think now this is more opened up towards HPC specific stuff. So we will talk, of course, about runtime build and distribute in this segments as well. Even though they are more focused on scheduling and orchestration, but during the panel discussion, it will evolve into we talk about all this things, right? All this stuff. So, yeah, this one about scheduling, orchestration, first swarm, then Kubernetes, and then uh, HPC schedulers uh, as well. And, yeah, so let's just jump in. First, is, first up is uh, Abdul. Here is your... And you can use the presenter. And, and the best is to stay here because the video will be best if you stay behind it. Hi, uh, my name is Abdurrahman Azab. I'm leading the container for HPC work package in Prace, and those are the uh, sites. Yeah, those are the Prace sites that are participating in this work package. I'll talk to you about Swarm lightweight orchestration. So. Uh, Swarm is a good orchestrator if you want to do something that you not really need to install Kubernetes because it comes together with Docker engine. You don't need to install anything else. You just need to run Docker in the Swarm mode. Um, this is These are some slides from the Enterprise edition of Docker. Docker UCP is the universal control plan where it is managing the containers and and Swarm managers. Here you can have multiple UCP managers, and this is the head node of Swarm, and under that you can have multiple workers. And this is simply how you deploy it. Uh, you don't need to buy it to deploy it. You, you, you need to buy the license for having specific features, but, but most of the features you don't need to buy the license for, so you can play with it. And it works for both Swarm and Kubernetes, native Kubernetes. Swarm Kit is something that is after Swarm, which is separate from Docker, and now they included it with the Docker engine as called Swarm Next. That's why you say Docker Swarm, blah, blah, blah. Orchestration, uh, you can use either Kubernetes-based or Swarm-based, and you can have Swarm Kit installed within the Docker engine on all of the worker and manager nodes. This is Swarm versus Kubernetes using the Docker Universal Control Plan. And both have stability, scalability, resilience, and auto healing. Uh, Kubernetes can be more scalable and more features, but Swarm has better isolation. The network operations of Swarm, I will just show two examples. Internal stateless swarm. Internal, this is an overlay network in the IP level. Stateless, each container has an elastic IP address. If it is down, you get another container with another IP address. This one, external, if you want the containers to be accessed from outside, then you have two overlay networks. One is the internal one between containers, and one is the ingress networks, so that here, port 80 is mapped out to port 8080 for every container that runs out there. I will show you very quickly a use case, containerized HPC with HT Condor and Swarm. HT Condor is another queuing system that is working more for HTC. It is also good for HPC. And the nice thing about it is that it has implicit support for VM workloads and Docker workloads. So Docker universe and the VM universe. And this is what we are doing, having a Swarm manager. And the HT Condor central manager is there, and we can expand the number of compute nodes, scale it up and down, and even have multiple clusters in multiple swarms. And this is how we do it. Swarm node LS, you get the 
and Docker node LS, you get the ones in the swarm cluster. And here we have the central manager node and two execute, uh, three execute nodes, one big execute and two small execute. This is how you scale. I want to increase the number of execute nodes. So I just say Docker service scale and the name of the service, VWare 2, they are becoming five. And here you can see they increased. And this is uh, getting into the head node of HT Condor. This is actually coming from the queuing system, not from Swarm. So it's very easy. The advice, our advice from this experiment, if you don't really need the features of Kubernetes, Swarm works well. And even if you're on a queuing system on the top of it, it works well with a good performance. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Abdul. And up next is are you, right, Daniel? Yep. OK, next up, Daniel from Ubercloud. Yeah, Kubernetes and HPC in less than five minutes, which is quite a challenge, yeah. <laughs> So uh, Kubernetes, I think everybody in the audience knows Kubernetes. It's the most successful or one of the most successful open source projects. Uh, there is a lot going on at the moment there. Uh, companies get bought, uh, like Heptio was bought by VMware. Heptio uh, was created by two of the uh, three founders of Kubernetes. Uh, then we have Red Hat. Uh, we had talks about Red Hat uh, uh, already. So they are investing a lot in Kubernetes. And also my uh, ex-company Pivotal is investing a lot in Kubernetes, they have a distribution called PKS. So uh, in order to understand Kubernetes a little bit better, I think uh, we are running through an example and what could be better suited than uh, running a batch job on Kubernetes. And that's possible, so batch jobs are supported in Kubernetes. So in order to submit a batch job, you have to declare the batch job in a YAML file. And then you have to send the YAML file over to the API server. And uh, the API server, uh -huh. Pinch and make oh. technical support. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and then uh, the API server accepts that, uh, but there can be can be hooks uh, called admission controllers, which can check and validate uh, the YAML file and can also change the YAML file. Uh, and then it's made persistent on disk via etcd. And then uh, a controller started. It's called job controller for the job object. And the job controller, uh, like every controller in Kubernetes, compares the current state to the expected state. And the expected state for a job should be that there should be a pod created. And uh, in that case, it's not yet there, so the job controller contacts the API server again and uh, creates this pod. And then we have something like a bound po uh, an unbound pod, meaning that a pod is not yet assigned to a compute node. And then the scheduler component, which is quite interesting in Kubernetes because it's an external process, uh, and you can have multiple external scheduler processes, and you can even have different ones uh, in Kubernetes. Then the scheduler picks up uh, unbound pods and assigns a node to the pods. And the scheduler, the standard scheduler, uh, has uh, the meanwhile, uh, since 1.9, uh, a queuing system, uh, a very uh, tiny queuing system, or a very simple queuing system, assigns the pod a priority and uh, takes the uh, pod in priority order uh, from that queue and assigns uh, uh, the node to, uh, to the pod. And then we have something called a bound pod. And uh, the bound pod is still not yet executed. Uh, this is what the kubelet does. So the kubelet watches uh, uh, the API API server for bound pods to this particular compute node. And then uh, the kubelet uh, gets this information about the pod, which has to be started. And then the kubelet starts the pod, but also not directly. It uses the CRI, the container runtime interface, where uh, we have lots of implementations. And Scilabs has an implementation for that, for singularity. There is Docker uh, D uh, implementation. Uh, there is uh, 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 yeah, Docker, in the, uh, uh, Docker implementation, and uh, we have Cryo. So uh, uh, Red Hat is now moving with OpenShift 4 to Cryo uh, for executing containers. And uh, so it's a pluggable concept, uh, the execution here. Uh, on, the, on the left side here, 
Uh, you see the YAML file, which is very, very simple here. But when, so when you're writing more complex application, you are creating lots of YAML files. And then you need a means for, uh, uh, for templating the YAML files and so on. For that, we have projects called Helm, or now uh, people are moving to operators. And now, in the last five minutes, we are uh, spending with Kubernetes and HPC. So we have uh, re HPC requirements for workload managers. One of them would be a fast job submission time. So if you're running high throughput scenarios, then uh, uh, it's important that uh, a job submission does not take a very long time. So uh, when I'm measuring cube control for job submission, it takes me hundreds of milliseconds. When I compare that to uh, something like grid engine, this takes 10 milliseconds. Then we have multi-node jobs. Uh, do we have multi-node job support in Kubernetes? Uh, well, not really. Nothing built in. Kubernetes uh, uh, takes care about pods. Pods are co-located containers meaning running all on one node or a container. Uh, these co-located containers are assigned to one particular node. But there are projects uh, like MPI operator coming from Kubeflow, which helps you running MPI jobs. And I think in the future, there will be much more support that coming from the or driven by the AI community. Then, do we have GPU support? Yeah, we have seen uh, GPU support. Uh, this is working very well. Uh, are traditional HPC applications integrated with Kubernetes? Uh, not yet, but newer AI applications are. Again, we have here the Kubeflow uh, project. Then, uh, do we have uh, job queuing capabilities? Yeah, very limited, but they are there. Uh, do we have job prioritization? Again, yes. Since 1.14, uh, we have that. Uh, but this is also very, very limited. So you have just something like priority band, so you can create a priority class, and then you can ask for a priority class, but that's a fixed number. There is nothing like a waiting time policy or a fair share, a historical fair share. Uh, uh, job preemption, preemption is there, but also only on pod level. Uh, which is completely different than uh, preempting an MPI job. Uh, then advanced reservation. Every HPC scheduler has advanced reservation. Um, Kubernetes does not have license management capabilities. Uh, well, nothing built in, but you can extend the, the scheduler with scheduler extenders to have cluster-wide resources. Then support for InfiniBand, Omnipath. Yes, there is a device plugin, so InfiniBand should be there. Uh, full hardware utilization, well, that depends on demons, on virtualization. So Kubernetes is running typically virtualized. So for Pivotal, for example, it only supports virtualized environments. This is something to take into account. Then, um, then uh, it also implements a completely fair schedule on process level. This is not ideal for HPC workload, but we have a, a thing called CPU Manager, which helps you uh, in that regard. Resource control, yes, for memory and CPU resources, accounting and reporting, that's great. Storage, yeah, you can in integrate storage. And that's it. <coughs> okay, we will, we will switch a little bit because uh, uh, Paolo has to, to catch a flight, so we will <laughs> squeeze him in before. Thank you. Where is it? Here's the yeah, start. Yeah, part of the book Okay, here's a clicker, and uh, if you stay yes. behind, that would be nice. So, I'm presenting this to the this next flow. It's a orchestrator, orchestrator for um, containerized uh, workload. Here, the, 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 the problem is to manage the, the execution, the deployment on large scale uh, job, uh, computing jobs into a cluster of computers. In the meaning of that, this is not focused for service orchestration, but for HPC job orchestration. And, um, was um, and next flow is the, the, the technology that, that, that we use and what, what it's doing. Basically, next flow is either a domain specific uh, language that, uh, that allows you to compose different tasks, the user tasks that can be uh, specified in common scripted language like Bash, R, Python, whatever you prefer. And then uh, the tool allows you to define the parallelization, the pipeline using a declarative programming model. Uh, based on the data flow paradigm. And then along with this, provide uh, a runtime that allows you to um, container, containerize your job in a declarative manner as well. So basically, the two manage the wrapping, the plumbing of the containers in a transparent manner. The user, the, 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 the developer does not have to take care about this. Along with this, then provide the ability to deploy 
the same pipeline, different platform. It can be a single computer, cluster computer using a, a legacy batch, batch scheduler like Slurm or Green Engine or a uh, cloud native scheduler like Kubernetes or directly in the cloud we use the AWS batch or Google pipeline, etc. So all the point is to decouple the pipeline implementation from the deployment logic. They are two completely different things. It allows you to have complete flexibility on the deployment in your pipeline. Just to give an idea, this is a simple task, maybe not so simple, but a common task that uh, uh, bioinformaticians users like to implement. They just concatenate, mesh up on many different tools. So normal tools like in this case, that card drop or whatever, bioinformatics tools using um, this approach. And the idea was to extend this ability because it's very easy to 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 to, to, to read, to write to, to many bioinformaticians or other developers to a higher level. So how to use the, the same model but to scale in the cloud on a big cluster. And oh half two minutes. And that is the, the idea. The idea is just to wrap the user command into the, this process definition, which then I can define which are the input and the output. Here there are just one file, an input file, an output file. I can have many inputs and many outputs, clearly. But all the point that once I have a, a task like this, I can create many of these tasks doing other things, and then I can compose the execution of these tasks in a bash similar manner, meaning that this, this pipe is not bash pipe. This is then next row pipe. I'm creating a channel with a file that triggers the execution of these tasks, and then I can, I can chain all the operation. And then, what's the point? And then I am running this with just one file, but then I want to scale the execution, not with a single file, but with thousands of files. So I'm just swapping the uh, channel declaration, I have the execution of thousands of files, uh, jobs, one for each file that I'm giving my pipeline. And this works in a single machine or in a cluster computer. Containerization is critical here because we need to isolate all the dependency of the job of the pipeline into a container so that I can deploy uh, seamless in a different environment without having to mess up to install all this stuff. And clearly, the idea is to, to wrap uh, each job in its own container, and Nextflow allows to, to manage this transparently with, with, with Docker, with Singularity, uh, and eventually also with other container runtime because this is the, the, the point. And then to, 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 to finish about the portability, you can run the same script in your computer just using the comma, comma line like, and like this, next row around your script, and you specify the container, and you run this in your computer. Then when you have prototype your pipeline, you change the configuration file. You say, I want to use like executor slurm instead of the local computer, and maybe Singularity uh, runtime, and you deploy the same pipeline into a run cluster providing production data. Maybe then you need to share this application with, with a colleague that does not have uh, a cluster you know, in, uh, to deploy the workflow, but want to deploy in the cloud, only change the configuration of your pipeline, you can deploy this pipeline into the cloud using AWS Batch or other technology. Uh, this is a small project, but has uh, quite a large adoption in many important research institute uh, organizations, just to give an, an idea uh, that is a stable, stable project. And if you are interested in t this application, have a look also at this project. It is a community maintained uh, collection pipeline using this technology. Thank you. All right, cool. Thanks, Paolo. Thank you. And now next up, I think it's draw. I think it's, uh, let me go back to where we left. <coughs> this we already had. Oh no, I think it's, it's uh, uh, right. two, yeah, sorry. Uh, you, you are next then, yeah. Don't worry, that one will be quick. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here you go. Yeah, maybe less. Uh, so just to, quickly uh, tell you about the work we've done uh, with um, 
uh, bringing a driver for Kubernetes to be able to use Luster. Uh, so you might be aware that uh, we have released, uh, so I'm always speaking on behalf of AWS, we have released our own managed version of uh, Luster a few months ago, uh, basically in last December. So now on AWS, you can super easily uh, launch a Luster file system and deploy it within, let's say, 10 to 15 minutes and mount it on uh, either a cluster or whatever you want to deploy on AWS. And we got the request from our uh, AI and ML users who, uh, as one of the previous speaker uh, uh, said, or used to run on Kubernetes uh, and they wanted to leverage Luster, which is pretty new for them, uh, contrary to probably most of you, and, and use it for a very AI and ML workload. Um, so our uh, um, research and development team looked at that, and the way they did it was uh, basically using the CSI model uh, to bring persistent storage resources to Kubernetes. Um, for those interested, we do have a full blog post with all the instruction to, to get that set up on uh, EKS on AWS. And uh, the source code uh, is available on GitHub and has been uh, pushed to uh, Kubernetes uh, SIGs. Um, yeah, that's mostly what it is. So basically, it allows you to um, declare a um, Luster file system within your uh, Kubernetes definition and then mount the file system within the containers and use uh, the file system to persist the data. Thank you. OK, awesome. OK, but now it's, now it's you. Yes, here you go. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, operators. I'll give you some uh, briefing about uh, what it is and why uh, we really need it for RDMA. And in general, we're looking into uh, operators uh, for SRIOV uh, devices in, in general. So starting from operators, uh, in general, operators are really method of uh, packaging, deploying, and managing uh, the Kubernetes uh, application. Uh, it really enables the developer to um, to to kind of add new functionality in more of a native fashion to to um, to Kubernetes without uh, you know changing the base code. And um, beyond that, it's about automating of administrative uh, task. Uh, but in a more native uh, fashion. So just as an example, um, we're kind of taking like how you configure um, the right uh, amount of SRIOV virtual functions uh, for SRIOV devices. So basically the flows of operators is to observe the current state, analyze it, what what's the difference between the desired and the, the observed, and then to act upon it and fix. So in this case, we really want to provision 64 uh, virtual functions uh, within the um, within the uh, pod and um, sorry within the host and the desired state is 64. However, we observe that there are 48, so we basically are going to act by uh, changing and reconfiguring it to 64 virtual functions. And when I'm talking about SRIV, is because the way we provision uh, RDMA uh, services is using uh, SRIOV. So operators are really more kind of uh, native, and once you use uh, operators, you basically can use the regular stuff like the Kubernetes CLI, APIs, and all the tools. So that's pretty much why we prefer uh, doing all this config uh, uh, and provisioning through um, operators. Uh, it's easier to kind of, whenever it's all integrated, you can, you can really um, monitor and manage and scale up and down uh, as you wish. Uh, and it's more kind of uh, easier to do. And um, basically, those operators are typically built by the guys that are doing DevOps on the cluster, so they know how to deploy and you know how to uh, install everything. So kind of this is um, the part that we really want to make it much more easy. So the Kubernetes RDMA solution, basically we have two ways to deploy RDMA uh, within a Kubernetes. Uh, the first approach is uh, by using a SRIOV. Uh, this is kind of the more 
uh, preferred approach that enables much uh, better isolation. And the second approach is by taking uh, a devices and completely sharing it between the different process. And actually, a lot of the HPC deployment will use uh, are, are using shared device, but um, I think in order to provide much better isolation and services, we probably would need to start migrating to, to SRIOV. So the SRIOV model actually um, is using the device plugin and the CNI plugin. Uh, first one is uh, taking care of the, uh, the SRIOV, uh, and the other one um, uh, takes care um, uh, of, of provisioning the virtual functions uh, into the containers. So it pretty much looks like that. So on the deployment node, you'll typically have the SRIOV operator. And that kind of operator is being uh, uh, developed together uh, today with Red Hat. It's going to be part of OpenShift, but it will be also available uh, to general Kubernetes uh, use cases. And in that operator, we're going to also add the RDMA-related uh, provisioning um, um, to, to enable that. And that's going to run on the deployment node, and that operator will take care of whatever is needed from the SRIOV device, pl device plugin and the SRIOV CNI. And uh, then you can see the pods that are being provisioned, that each pod gets its own virtual function, its own namespace, its own IP address, its own RDMA services. They're completely isolated, and the whole work of configuring everything and installing everything uh, is is much more transparent. And uh, just to explain a little bit about the difficulties of, of provisioning those RDMA services, then yes, it needs some driver installation uh, for things that uh, people that want some better performance than maybe less, latest uh, upstream, uh, some configuring of the link state, InfiniBand Ethernet, some InfiniBand or RDMA related uh, configuration, SRIV configuration. So the bottom line is integrating all of them into uh, an RDMA SRIV operator makes a lot of sense and will simplify uh, the deployment. Thank you. Cool, perfect on time. Thank you. Now it's Michael. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Here you go. Thank you. Cool. So I want to talk a little bit about Singularity plus Slurm plus Kubernetes. Um, so first of all, <laughs> uh, first of all, you can now use Kubernetes and run uh, Singularity underneath as the container runtime. So we've implemented uh, a server that uh, satisfies the CRI. It's the container runtime interface. So essentially, it's already working. Uh, you can go ahead and go try it out. Um, we do request lots of feedback right now because it's still sort of in like alpha-ish state, maybe beta-ish state. Um, but the long story short is it totally works. It also has native support for things like GPUs, InfiniBand, RDMA. Uh, all of that's really working right out of the box. So we've, we've sort of taken care to bundle in uh, HPC-centric tools uh, right with the, the CRI itself. So something that we got asked to, to sort of help develop and build was um, an ability to do multi-cluster scheduling through Kubernetes. So let's say I have two Slurm clusters, and they're not connected to each other. And I also have a Kubernetes resource, and I want to hook them all together so that uh, just one user can go to a single unified place and submit some kind of, of file, a deployment file, or whatever it may be, and have access to both the clusters and the Kubernetes services infrastructure that you've built. Um, so. Oh, and, and also to do all this as an unprivileged user, right? So that's exactly what we built. What we built is essentially a, a capability in Kubernetes to do multi-cluster scheduling. Um, so what it looks like in practice is that we've added a, a new job or a new kind to the Kubernetes API using a custom resource definition. It's called a Slurm job. So we can um, Slurm job, right? And what happens is that there is there is a kubelet that lives on the master node of, of or the submission node rather of any Slurm cluster, and 
when you when you go ahead and you set up this integration, it will go onto those Slurm nodes. You tell it that there is the Singularity Container platform available. You tell it that there is a Slurm available here, and it will go ahead and, and hook this all up together. So in practice, what it what it ends up looking like is I can now have a Kubernetes cluster with connected batch job components. And because it's defined as a custom resource definition, it's adding this new API type, you can now take advantage of Kubernetes concepts like error handling, fault tolerance, uh, duplication, load balancing, whatever it is, you can take advantage of that and tie that with services. And then you can also use batch jobs at the same time. So uh, you know, an example, a use case for a project like this is um, I'm running I'm running an inferencing service, for example, maybe, and you want to tie your inferencing service every you know 24 hours. You want to run a Slurm job to update the model and train it on some new data that you've acquired, and so you can now you know speak to Kubernetes about this in the same way that Kubernetes understands the rest of these concepts. <coughs> Um, another example that was sort of brought up, I think, yesterday in some conversations I was having is there, there's a database that, that my batch job needs, and my user wants to set that database up. They don't really have the ability to do that right now. Well, you can just give them access to Kubernetes then, and then you can tell them, here, run your, run your database as a Kubernetes service, which is like a, you know, it's a solved problem already. And then you can also run your Slurm job as a Kubernetes you know, service, quote unquote, and they can directly communicate and, and talk to each other in the way that, that we expect and the way that Kubernetes expects. And so you can take advantage of all of these um, you know, diverse tools for this Kubernetes infrastructure that already exists. Um, so practically, it basically, I mean, really, it just looks like this. Uh, right now, it's kind of, I mean, you know, it's kind of straightforward. Essentially, what we've done is we've given you the ability to um, embed an SBAT, like a Slurm script, right into a Kubernetes deployment file. Uh, you notice at the bottom there's like a node selector. Uh, so we've added the ability to say, hey, this node has a singularity container. Uh, this will also be extended to say, hey, this, this partition of uh, this Slurm partition has access to these GPUs or this kind of interconnect. Um, you know, we can extend it to storage or, or whatever. Um, and it becomes a very generalized way to pick a, a cluster and, and run a job on a specific cluster that has what you need available. And then, of course, Slurm on the cluster will be able to put it into the queue um, and then manage the resources like it, it normally would. I'm about out of time, so that's all. <clears throat> very disciplined. Thanks. That's your concern. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and we went through this already. Yeah. Arthur. Yep. Now we have more than two slides, right? A little bit. <laughs> Thanks for keeping the mic on. <laughs> Um, so, uh, back to AWS, so we have a service called AWS Batch um, that serves as a, let's say, simplified uh, batch API to run containers. Uh, so that thing is um, built without specifically HPC in mind, but more as a generic batch system that allows you to schedule containers, um, not in a persistent way, but in, but in a purely uh, uh, batch way. The reason for us to implement that uh, was because we saw that many of our customers were implementing batch system on top of ECR, uh, uh, which is one of our um, uh, container orchestrator. And they were building that um, using ECR plus some of our queuing system to build their own batch system. And we figured out there could be a good opportunity for us to directly provide a managed service that would do exactly that and so that they could focus on their business and not on rebuilding yet another batch system. Um, so that's what we did. Uh, it's pretty much integrated into all of our services, which means that you can handle uh, the roles that you usually uh, use on AWS. Um, you can um, choose whatever AMIs you want to uh, run the, the, the containers on. And uh, let's dig a little bit on the different components uh, that this system exposes. Um, so at the top of it, um, it just exposed the concept of a job queue, uh, which is, well, pretty similar to what you know about a queue. Uh, um, um, 
then it allows you to define compute environments, which is basically a mapping between uh, the types of instances that you want to use, the type of compute nodes, and uh, the, 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 the operating system images that you might use. By default, it's going to use a, uh, an Amazon Linux um, image, but you can replace that by the image you prefer. Uh, for example, you add an image that would support GPUs and allow you to run um, container jobs on uh, on some of our GPU-enabled instances. Um, on top of that, you then declare uh, job definitions, uh, job definitions being nothing more than uh, the association between a container that you build yourself at put in, in our registry and some parameters that you can pass to um, uh, to the, the, the container when you run it. And using those job definition, uh, you will then instantiate jobs uh, that are going to be pushed to one of the queues that you've defined. Uh, the scheduler that is behind is pretty simple today. That's mainly uh, um, a FIFO. Uh, we plan to enable more complex uh, um, queuing strategy. Uh, we already handle dependencies, so you can define a direct acyclic graph of jobs and they will execute the right way. Uh, but having things more complex like preemption and that kind of stuff is something we are still considering and waiting for um, feedback from our customers to decide whether we will do it or not. Um, it's relatively easy to run massively parallel job on it. Uh, the only thing is, given the, the um, the throughput that is given uh, by something like either ECR or Kubernetes, uh, you're not close to the the rate of jobs that you can uh, submit using something like Slurm. Uh, the, the the level of transaction per second you can get from such an engine is pretty low compared to HPC standards. Um, and to be able to massively scale, you'd better use job arrays on it uh, rather than single uh, um, um, elementary jobs, let's say. Um, we have a pretty good dependency models where you can uh, um, put dependency between job arrays, put dependencies between uh, individual jobs uh, so that you can define a complex workflow. And uh, we recently introduced um, support for multi-node parallel jobs in AWS Batch so that you can launch MPI jobs across several containers. Um, the way we do it is since we pretty much have the control over our network interface, we have the ability to bring directly our network interface inside the containers and not having to use the overlay network. Uh, so you don't have the kind of penalties you usually have with the overlay network. Um, typical AWS batch job architecture. Um, you can trigger the jobs from whatever even sources that you want to use on AWS. Can be an event on uh, a file uh, being written to S3. Could be something completely different. A message sent to a queue. Uh, um, there's plenty of event sources, scheduled event sources. Then the jobs are generated and submitted to the queue, executed on the compute environment that AWS is going to scale for you. And then you can write the, the result uh, almost wherever you were, you want. That can be S3, that can be a uh, luster file system that you're going to mount in the container. Uh, you're pretty free about that. Thank you. Cool, awesome, thanks. So, oh, and you don't need to go that far. I mean, you're close anyways, because now we have the little panel. So everyone <coughs> participated. How much time did I think I would use for this? Really? 30 minutes, I think. 30 minutes, yeah. yeah. Awesome. OK. OK, panel is open. Discuss. And we have another microphone here as well. And of course, this one. Questions? So um, I'm curious first about the integration that you guys have done. I'm still trying to understand 
how much um, awareness is there between the Kubernetes side and the and the Slurm side in this? I can hear Test? you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, there we go. <laughs> I'll just yell. Um, so, so there's actually quite a bit of sort of communication that's going on, and that is what I would say the bulk of the work that we've done really is about. Um, the rest of the components for this infrastructure sort of could apply to any scheduler. Um, but what, what we've done is we've created, essentially, <clears throat> Kubernetes will be able to do, you can do things like, you know, um, kubectl logs job name and it will show you live stream output of the jobs running from slurm for example uh, it'll also be able to tell you like um these are the resources available in these partitions this is who can schedule into them um all, all of those things are totally already done i would say um also like result aggregation works too um, the ability to see if the job is running or not. So, like, if the job fails, that that will be reflected um, when you're going to do like, you know, you can do like cube cuddle, um, get slurm job or something like that, and it will show you, okay, this is failed, this is running, this is how long it took, all of those things. Um, so, I'd say there's quite a bit of of communication going on there. It, it, can you schedule a cube? A, Kuberne a, a standard Kubernetes job inside the same Slurm cluster, or, or is it sort of like only Slurm jobs go into the the Slurm cluster? Does that make sense? Um, yeah, that makes sense. I, I don't see a reason why you couldn't. Um, in pr like in theory, that that works. Yes. Um, in practice, there would need to be some mechanism for controlling when we could run a standard Kubernetes service on a node that Slurm is talking to and is running jobs on, right? right. Because it's it's provisioning those resources and keeping track of all of that. Um, and, and so I, there's nothing really that's been done there so far okay. on our end to, yeah. to handle that. Um, that's what we're trying to think about, like, in the Perlmutter time frame. You know, ideally what we'd like is people could commit, could submit classic Slurm jobs, they could submit kube jobs, and it would all go on a common infrastructure, and it would, each side would, what I'd really like is for the Slurm to do all the scheduling because it's got more advanced policy features than what we have in Kubernetes. But you know, I don't. There's some missing stuff there. It seems like right yeah, now. Yeah. So there is the possibility to um, implement custom like scheduling and resource management and allocation algorithms in Kubernetes. So you can, you know, we could theoretically develop some sort of um, deeper integration with with one of these you know resource managers that ties directly into the the back end of Kubernetes and would allow Kubernetes then to use Slurm's resource allocation and, and scheduling policy to to handle things like that. Um, but I think from a practical perspective, that that will be a lot of like edge cases and corner cases to to resolve. So um, my next question is again related to the same topic. Um, Slurm doesn't really appreciate when resources show up or disappear. Um, so are we talking about a Slurm pod which has a certain set of number of cores from the beginning to the end? Or it, does it have some sort of auto-scaling within the job? Uh, how does that part operate? Um, so, so right if I, if I understand the correct question correctly, right now what's happening is you have an entire Slurm allocation on, on a cluster, and essentially all you're a, what you're able to do is, is use Kubernetes as a means to submit jobs uh, to that Slurm cluster, um, but it's not like scaling up the cluster itself or scaling up the job that, that's running within Slurm, right? What, what you can do is you can like you know, use Kubernetes concepts to change how the job is, is submitted multiple times into Slurm. And so you could, you know, run, an, run a training job, realize I need to train for a longer period of time, actually. And then you could go and sub have it go and automatically submit again with, you know, a different length of time, for example. And, and this kind of extends the cluster to use a different resource that is not part of the Kubernetes cluster itself, right? In your case, the login node or the submit node is part of the Kubernetes cluster, but the Slurm cluster itself, the workers of the Slurm cluster are not, right? So, Correct. It's a side -side so, thing. so you would have an entire cluster that Kubernetes doesn't even know about. The only thing that Kubernetes needs to know about and the only thing you really need to install from Kubernetes on your cluster is just on a submission node, you just need a kubelet there to talk. And then the rest is sort of handled by this integration that we've built then. Yeah. 
But then if you want to have a shared cluster where you can do Kubernetes and Slurm on the same nodes, they wouldn't know which node is currently used by Slurm and then the kubelet wouldn't know. I mean, it, it could, but l like that's kind of what Shane was asking. We, there would have to be some more deep integration built to like unify the, the scheduling algorithm, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and and I think that's kind of what 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 you just described, right? You have Swarm, you have Kubernetes, and the HPC scheduler side by side, using the um, the the nodes underneath, right? And the you execute your your HPC jobs and your Kubernetes jobs with Cryo and or Cry Singularity. CRI yeah, it's all it's all Singularity native. It, I don't think it works with any other CRI. But the the schedulers. They don't know of each other's resource use. Correct. They don't know of each other's resource utilization. And another yeah, way yeah. of doing it would be that, like Daniel said, there, there can be different schedulers in Kubernetes. So we could have a Slurm controller, a Slurm scheduler that uses the Kubernetes primitives and just works as a different scheduler. Yeah. Even though we have yeah. the problem of job creation, if it takes like 500 milliseconds, then you cannot sub submit 1 million jobs. Yeah, this was uh, done by Univa a couple of years ago. So at Univa, uh, we, we brought the uh, uh, grid engine scheduler on top of Kubernetes as a, as a interchange for, for the scheduler plugin here. So th there are a lot of possibilities to extend the scheduler, meanwhile, in, in Kubernetes. But another approach would be also to, to run uh, your workload manager, your HPC scheduler inside uh, Kubernetes itself, So which would bring additional advantages. So That's a reoccurring theme, like who is in control of whom, yeah, right? Yeah. Well, Every, everybody <laughs> wants to stay on top. I think, yeah. I think that concept of running like, like, you know, running Slurm or whatever within Kubernetes, I think that's something that essentially could be done and is separate and I think complementary to the integration we've built, right? Because if... Yeah. And we've, I think there's movement in that direction, uh, but you know this deeper integration, I think, is a little bit tougher. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, if you if you have the ability to, so I have a cluster with you know thousands of nodes, and there's just Kubernetes kubelets everywhere. If I could then go, okay, I want to, I'm just requesting 50 nodes to become a Slurm partition. Um, if Kubernetes could then, in a containerized way, go and spin up the Slurm cluster for you, then you could use again, what we've already built to talk and reason with it and schedule to it, um, that, that would be like, you know, theoretically, if you just containerize a Slurm installation and, and put it in Kubernetes, that's ready. You, you know, you could do that already, I think. But the, the resource allocation and the quotas within this, like, set up Slurm cluster for you, that's not, they don't exchange information then, right? So you have, like, a resource allocation within Kubernetes that spins up a a Slurm cluster, and then maybe you, you just say that since it's an exclusive Slurm cluster for me, I don't care about resource scheduling anymore, but I mean, you, you cannot then share it with different users. You could also go the other direction. You could put Kubernetes into Slurm. And so oh, yes. you, could, you could say, hey, I, you know, I need to spin up a Kubernetes cluster. I, I, need, to, I need to run a database for my, for my uh, you know, machine learning job or whatever. So give me, um, you know, give me 10 kubelets. And if you run it like, I think there's like user netties where it's user space Kubernetes. And I've thought about like, it's just no, a normal job at that point. But it's like, yeah. So th this stuff is all running as, as user. It's totally unprivileged. I mean, I think the advantage, if the Slurm could talk back to Kubernetes, what could be interesting about that is it could say, um, I've got more work. Can you give me more nodes, right? And then also it could say, like, these nodes are idle. You can have them back and do Kubernetes, you know, standard Kubernetes stuff on it, too, would be another model. If we go a step back to the... I think it's... Okay. If we go to a step back to um, how useful is, it could be for uh, the end user, I loved your example about having a job that need to spawn a database and then use the database for the job. Are you seeing other interesting use cases for a customer? Because uh, I visit a lot of expertise and good practices built into existing HPC scheduler. The, the level of throughput we have, the level of information we have about the jobs when they're running is super useful for HPC customer. And we don't have that uh, uh, in container orchestrator right now, which makes it pretty difficult to build a service like 
AWS Batch that makes that gives the same service to the users. We've seen that. We've been burned with that. And and yeah, I'm curious about the use cases. Uh, uh, I don't have so many, uh, um, but if among the users you do have some, I'm really curious about that. There is some. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there are some uh, research use cases. For example, um, in Norway, the National Resource, uh, Research Infrastructure, the research groups, they store their data on a specific file system. And this is not a parallel file system. It's mainly for storing data, and they have a Kubernetes cluster on the top of that. This Kubernetes cluster is mainly for running services. Some of the users, they need HPC. What they do is that they have to copy all of their data from this file system to the parallel file system of the HPC cluster that is Slurm. What the users are asking now, why don't we run some HPC or, HP or HTC jobs on, this, on the Kubernetes cluster? They don't have like highly parallel MPI where they need the advantage of InfiniBand and the parallel file system. So this is... Uh, an existing issue that we are trying to find the best way to resolve. Yeah, yes. so other, I mean, other use case, I mean, the big one, and I think the one that kind of motivated the integration in the first place is, can we connect up and make a bunch of different resources, you know, all across the country or even globally distributed? Can I make these resources available to a pool of users that live all over the world so that you know, they have access to, you know, a CRAY system. They have access to a GPU-enabled system. So it's they kind have, of federation of some sort? Yeah, you know, something like that. And then also, you know, Kubernetes already has concepts of, like, you know, who is allowed to access which which of these things. And, and you know, you can control it in that way and reason about it using Kubernetes concepts. Um, so it makes it really attractive to, to link a bunch of systems up together. Right. I, I what think I like about it, oh, just, just real quick, what I like about it is that it's just the first step, right? Once we, we start going down this path that it's described in a Kubernetes object, then yep. we can swip, swap out this, this implementation and use something else. But that's the first step to start integrating. We are it. having users come to us now and say, like, do you have a Kubernetes system that I can run stuff on, right? Now, we, we usually try to break it down a little bit to understand, like, what is it that they're trying to do? And so if they're going to run services, we have something that's kind of tailored for that. But, you know, I think you, we are starting to see, because there are, um, you know, workflow engines and other things that are kind of built on top of, of Kubernetes, now they're saying, like, well, I just want to be able to use that interface. So I think having it as an interface would be a useful thing. But then we still need to figure out how to kind of marry these, um, this resource management piece between them. Yeah, so I, th I think there's, there's a, you know, deeper integration in the future that's going to be really cool. Um, So we had previously had some discussions offline about uh, comparisons, you know, this analysis of uh, the scheduler on top of uh, the orchestrator, vice versa, or whatever. And one of the things that, you know, many of us here uh, had called out, so feel free to jump in. Uh, among them were sort of... It, uh, with, at the orchestration level, it's often used more for services of like start up a pod that's going to do something, whereas uh, and Kubernetes um, uh, and other orchestrators may not have the same notion of time and of uh, detailed resource management that a scheduler would. And so uh, there were a number of people that were sort of shifting uh, and in the direction of advocating orchestration for being able to have something that's maybe a little more human readable for people that don't know that much about sort of what's going on under the covers with schedulers uh, to say, yeah, I, I want something like a service. I get a whole batch and other kinds of things that are coming up from this space. Please make sure the right things go happen. And then have somebody, have another agent which knows a whole lot more about real-time constraints, about not oversubscribing. I must have this uh, and you can't take anything away until I'm done. Uh, and you can't fail, um, which you can do. You can uh, get very greedy and aggressive at an orchestration layer and say, you know, assume this will work, but maybe it won't, and so you might have to fail later, and that's okay because I'll just, you know, start up another instance and try again type deal. Um, that 
there are a number of differences in the usage model, and we actually put together kind of a, a table of commonalities of the usage models and expectations across the enterprise and the HPC. So um, yeah. I don't know if you want to uh, – maybe we can point to that as an output here for the, the web page or whatever as collateral yeah. um, that we can refer to this by. Yeah. But I think that – Sort of looking at what are we trying to do and what are what are they respectively good at um, can allow uh, us to focus on interoperability rather than each one to say you know hey I'm better than you are type deal. Yeah. And beyond scheduling and orchestration, I mean the HPC schedulers they are not only schedulers they are also like tying together different domains, different vendor uh, implementations. So how do, can we integrate this into maybe Kubernetes or a high-level thing, or is it even possible? Because, I mean, the, the HPC um, schedulers are also a glue that puts things together, right? What do, what do you guys think? How this Can we integrate stuff that is... Like, can we not, upstream this? Yeah, yeah, can we make, like, Kubernetes plugins for inspecting how an application and, and, and the CFD application runs and how, how can we like stop it or inspecting it? Or I, don't know. Um, I think it's a good question. I think it's something like it's kind of something we're, we're looking into actively. Um, the, the one thing that I'll, I'll say, you know, every time we've presented this anywhere, the first thing that we get from people is, can, th can my scheduler do this too? Can, can we do this with, you know, Univa Grid Engine or PBS or, you know, whatever it is. So I think the first step is to start bringing in all, you know, the schedulers in and to get that all, all working so that there's implementations that everyone can use. And then to start like looking at commonalities and places that there's similarities and then, you know, maybe upstream some of the, the higher level, you know, primitives there that are sort of shared. That might be something that, you know, makes sense down the line. I, definitely. Yeah, maybe from a network, from, from Mellanox perspective, what are things that the scheduler is doing for you? And that's like a curveball question, maybe, but yeah. what is... I need to think a little bit more about that, but uh, I guess, you know, the network devices, uh, at the end of the day, they'll be like any other resource that, that is there. I mean, we really want to, um, you know, to enable as many networking devices and to slice them so that you always have enough resources um, and if you don't you have to treat it like any other resource when you come to do the the scheduling so that should be kind of integrated natively and the scheduler will have to take care of, of but it that. could be integrated with ufm like with, with what is it called shield like your 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 self-healing capability so that you if you see there is a constraint I on a certain partition shield, like anywhere, make no, something up, like. i think shield is focused on you know fixing uh, network problems so in case of you have a switch or cable fault we can uh, uh, really isolate that and react to that very fast so it has nothing to do um you know with resources on the host it's more mostly around networking, uh, uh, networking issues. UFM can be a good place to kind of uh, connect to with a RESTful interface to understand whatever is happening on the network. Uh, I guess this can be like a step two after we solve all the basic problems. <laughs> uh, uh, so I think like, we should walk before we run. <laughs> uh, but afterwards, yeah, uh, UFM can provide a lot of insight on, on the network, uh, issues that are happening, and uh, where would it be a good place to um, put the job uh, in network-wise, uh, topology aware and those kind of things, maybe provide different uh, quality of service uh, level to those applications. But I yeah, think we need to... Yeah. Uh, also for GPUs, right? If you have like a GPU that can take a certain job but not another job, so you need more fine-grained yeah. insight, insight into what, what the jobs, jobs needs is. And maybe just related to that too, there's a notion of uh, what kinds of understanding of resources do each of the orchestrator and schedule need to understand and in what granularity. Because an orchestrator may care about things at the granularity of whole nodes and the scheduler may care about subdividing devices which are shared or virtualized or whatever and may want to have much more detailed uh, and low level information presented to it so i'm i'm still wondering whether for those of us that are more on the vendor side whether it makes sense to have uh, some sort of a unified notion of describing our resources and an interface for both schedulers and orchestration and container divide you know uh, runtimes and so far i'm a little skeptical that one size fits all 
you are looking for a system that is both doing orchestrating or orchestration and scheduling as a whole system yes, yes. but yeah. that system may be composed of components which you know anybody who knows me i'm a big advocate of interoperability and of like let's let's everybody understand what they're good at let's understand where there's overlap and see how to make you know play nicely together can you throw it back the last so so to touch on that topic, right, like about the, the, the differences in granularity required by Kubernetes versus Slurm, for example, right? So, so Kubernetes probably only cares about, um, you know, I just need this hardware available on this, this partition, and then Slurm can go ahead and like do the fine-grained control. And so, so in the, the Slurm job API that we've, we've built up and then tied into Kubernetes, that concept is there now. So, so at the bottom there, it says like node selector, okay, container singularity. So that's like, this is like the, the most basic of like hello world examples. Um, so it's saying, I just need to run on a, on a Slurm partition that has singularity containers. Um, but that's also being extended to, I need an NVIDIA GPU in this cluster. I need RDMA, I need, you know, blah, blah, blah. All you have to do is tell Kubernetes that you need this and it will put you on the right cluster that has access to that resource. And then Slurm will do like, you know, the fine grain control. But for this, if you specify, I need a G a two GPUs at least on the host, you, you cannot really, I mean, or you could annotate nodes, but it's, it's hard to get a uniform cluster with, with Kubernetes maybe, right? Because you say, I need at least two, or how fine grained do you do you try the scheduler to to tie it down to a V100 or P100? If you say just I want two GPUs, then you will get two GPUs, and you might get a different GPUs at the at the yeah, end. Yeah, so, so Slurm Slurm handles the the details there, right? What you tell Kubernetes in in this Slurm job API is put me on a on a a resource that has GPUs. It has NVIDIA GPUs, and then nice. Slurm will you know. You'll be able to tell Slurm, I want you know this X Y Z GPU with these specifications. I need minimum this RAM because it's really good at reasoning about that. Uh, and so you don't you need don't... to tell Kubernetes. You, you you just need to get onto a cluster with that hardware, and then you can let Slurm run with what it's good at. Yeah, but since you run Kubernetes and Slurm side by side without knowing from each other, you have the same problem like hyper hypervisors where you have a kernel on the host and a kernel within the within the within the guest VM, so that yeah. No, so, so that's not in, in the current architecture. That's that's not what's happening. Um, so so in the, cur the current architecture, it looks like this, right? These Kubernetes no like nodes in the the Slurm bubbles are really just for submitting jobs, and they're blocked off from from the rest of Kubernetes uh, orchestration. Slurm very yeah, much yeah, so owns those yeah, resources. You're just giving Kubernetes the ability to interface and just reason about those resources okay. so they they look to kubernetes as like just one uh, kubernetes sees them as just one node and, and it doesn't know what is there right? correct right. but yeah. when, you, when you look at it through the cube cuddle api it will be able to tell you information about the cluster yeah. it's, just it's just like, like it thinks of a cluster as a node so that's yeah. globally a cube proxy to slurm yeah good enough yeah okay Hello. Uh, uh, this is Can all. You move it up? Yeah, sure. This is all extremely exciting because uh, I don't know how many people here remember, but 10, 11 years ago, before cloud computing came along, there's something called grid computing. <laughs> yes. This is almost, almost exactly that. that. So, I, I believe some of those problems of uh, you know multi-cluster access or a user accessing multi-clusters probably sit sitting in different places. There are a number of things that have already been done. Work has been done in that area a number of years ago, and I'm really glad to see it all kind of coming back. Of course, nowadays you have GPUs and technologies moved on and all that, but great stuff. It's all coming back now. Uh, tired uh, just about grid computing, because my main research was in grid computing. Same here. So, yeah. <laughs> grid. By the way, it's not dead, and the new name of grid computing is Cloud Federation. The same, exactly yeah. the same thing, so <laughs> <laughs> just apply it there. It's all clouded over, isn't it? Yeah. Just change the we, name, we right? Recycle passwords every 10 years. Yeah, 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 of right. course. Exactly. <laughs> um, the, the, there is something called, in, in HT Contour, called the grid universe. Well, you have the HT Contour cluster, and you can have a Slurm cluster as an HT Contour node. And you can get some attributes about the Slurm cluster or the PBS cluster to the main uh, Contour central manager. So this is something that I think is very similar to, uh, so the concept is applicable and was tested before. I know it's going to be a red hole, but I will, I will time slot it with five minutes. But we, we 
someone touched on it, and I don't want to get too deep into it, but we have also the problem of data lifecycle, right? And, and how to move data from, let's say you have a Slurm job with a database or you have Slurm job that uh, puts out some data and how do you get it back into the Kubernetes cluster and vice versa, right? So let's not go like too red holy in it, but like just touching on it maybe that so, everyone is okay, aware. So I, 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 it's unfortunate. So, so we have two example um, jobs from this demo that I cut this script from, um, but the other one actually showcases exactly that. So I wish I would have showed it but essentially what happens is you have the ability to define like an, an output result directory um, and then you can propagate like a shared file system and it will get propagated across all of the slurm jobs and then also in the kubernetes pod that is sort of representing or you know representing the slurm job and because of that what happens and what it ends up looking like is you just tell your your job where to put the data and then the data just appears and is accessible um, where you would expect it to appear. So you can tar it up and then just CD into the shared folder and then boom, it's there. And right, because you're doing it with Kubernetes, you can, you know, you don't have to have it on your local system. You can just like pop open a pod and have access to the data immediately there. Yeah, what I, what I really liked about this next flow thing, and uh, I mean, uh, Pablo is gone, but what, what he does here is defining like input and output. And with this, you can tie together different job stages and make sure that they have the same input kind and input type so that it's like a tar gz is the the exchange format here but it could also be a stream or it could also be something else so i think more, more this meta scheduling is maybe something that kubernetes needs to adopt or i don't know because now our exchange mechanism is just a posix file system and that's it right you you put it there and then you read it from there but maybe we need some more abstract scheduling mechanisms to do that like this i mean you could tie you could theoretically tie like the work we've done into like a container storage interface plugin you know hook up a csi plugin to some service that you're running and then also um create a pod that's essentially making um the the result data of a slurm job available in that you know in a, as a shared file system or, or whatever the csi thing is doing and then you could tie that all together and it would, you know, it would look really great. It'd be really pretty, I think. Cool. Other questions? Yeah, if I'm right. Um, until now, we have discussed, okay, that we have different resources and so on. But what was um, missed a little bit is that even if we have two nodes with same CPU, same GPU and so on, they might be on a different um, network part what might have a big impact on the, um, on the application. So how should be this addressed? That there are some applications outside that if you don't run them on one single switch, they are dead. Yeah, and I think that's what's, what's the piece that is from the HPC scheduler that he knows yeah, about co-location. Exactly. So, so Slurm, Slurm reasons with that, right? And, and Kubernetes has no, in my opinion right now, no need to even understand that concept, right? All you need to tell be able to tell Kubernetes is this job is able to run on this set of resources. And then Slurm will, you know, figure out the details and put your job co-located or, or whatever it needs to be. Yeah. And I guess that's what, what AWS Batch might under the hoods do, like if you have a... Sure. Uh, and, and globally, one of the reasons why things like Kube don't exposes that because that you uh, uh, basically you handle that one layer below uh, you handle that when you bring up the resources and you ensure that um, a, a pool of node is in the same uh, let's say close to each other that's what we call a placement group uh, the other ones most probably have the same concepts um, so yeah that's just that you don't and all those at the same place, and it becomes irrelevant at the other one because you already take, have taken care of it. But do we have this notion in Kubernetes or an upcoming notion about this? I mean, the enterprise maybe not does not care about this so much, but I mean, maybe they. Yeah, you have these scheduler extenders where where you get uh, no, um, suggestions from from the Kubernetes scheduler where it could run potentially, and then you can shrink make shrink the amount of nodes, saying oh. You, so you can write your own placement with that. Yeah, okay. And, and actually, we're I think under the hood, that's what we're leveraging to be like, hey, you have to run on this type of this this like Slurm node to get it into the like physically onto the Slurm node that you can submit it with. 
the, the other thing with the cloud approach is, uh, and that was one of the reasons why I was curious about the use cases, is uh, since we have this pretty much elastic resources, we have the luxury of being able to have both a a, a cube cluster and a slurm cluster, whatever scheduler we, you want to use, and we don't have that much the problem of having to mix both. And uh, in a good Unix fashion, we tend to push our user to use the right tool for the right jobs and not mix them in a more difficult way. That's not a luxury you have on prem. Yeah, you don't deal with Los Alamos. Legacy workloads. Well, I've done that for 15 years, so I know this trouble. I had to deal with them. Just yeah, constraints are slightly yeah, that different. That was kind of the question I was going to ask. Is in the in the Kubernetes space, I think that generally they're running in an, an environment where it's they assume it's elastic, and so it's just about like just getting it to run right as fast and as reliably as possible. Whereas in the HPC space, at least at the centers, there's always more work than there is resource, right? And it and it's a it's about policy, like who's going to get to run next, yeah. right? And making sure, like you've got this big job, I've got to drain resources so I can run it. You know how many? Do, do you see any kind of traction within the cloud space where they they have similar kind of constraints and they're starting to think about it within Kubernetes having more native ways to deal with that? From my standpoint, what I do see more uh, uh, in the cloud is the constraint is the money. Yeah. Whereas on prem, the constraint is the amount it's of resource money, you but have. It's already spent that's money. Just, yeah. 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 That's yeah. money <laughs> when you buy it, and, yeah. and then it becomes the space. Uh, so you just handle it in a different way, and that's almost that. Uh, Enterprises tend to do their scheduling at the budget level. So uh, here, here is my team doing some engineering. They're they're going to have that amount of money, and that's what they're going to be able to spend. And 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 that's the way they more or less do the scheduling. And we don't have tools for that, unfortunately. But yeah, that's okay. We have still five minutes, or we can move on and spend the time. Um, my question is related to uh, usage of InfiniBand. Uh, if there are multiple containers running on a single host with one InfiniBand card, how flexible is the C groups implementation so that this kind of thing can be handled? Okay, so so I'm going to touch that in the next session about uh, how we we isolate between uh, containers in general. Um, Today, a lot of the HPC workloads, they're kind of taking one device and sharing it. So it's not really isolated. It does the work so you can containerize thing and you can really deploy very easily. Um, the direction that we are pushing now is to actually use SRIOV. And with SRIOV, both in Finibed and Ethernet, you get the same RDMA services. Um, and with SRIOV, you can actually assign a namespace that will be per network element and that network element is going to include the um, the well-known net device that represents the IP address of the container and in addition to that you can also take the RDMA device or the IB device in the Linux name and you'll take the IB device and you'll as assign it also to a namespace and when you create that you can give a full isolated RDMA services and networking services to every single container so you can have full isolation and the scale of it will be the number of virtual functions. So what I pr uh, presented um, in this talk is, you know, how we can uh, actually simplify the SRIOV configuration with an operator. So when you go deploy that cluster, then you can, you know, make sure that all the SRIOV is well prepared. And obviously, we'll add the rest of the stuff to the CNI and to the SRIOV device uh, plugins. And, you know, it will be really easy to set uh, everything. But in general, Definitely, isolation is a very big thing, and we really want to to enable also non-homogeneous jobs to concurrently run uh, on the same uh, on the same node. So, all right, I think we move on to the next section, and then we will have another panel so we can pick up the stuff as well. All right, cool. Thanks, guys. Okay, so next, there's this. This is the shortest segment, and it's only two slots. 